Good morning. Good morning. Is it on? Good morning and uh, welcome to the October 18th meeting of the Santa Cruz County Regional Transportation, Transportation Commission Transportation Policy Workshop. Could we start with a roll call? Commission Alternate Gregorio. Here. Commission Alternate Mulhern. Here. Commissioner Johnson. Here. Commissioner McPherson. Here. Commissioner Bator. Here. Commissioner Leopold. Here. Commissioner Brown. Commission Alternate Schifrin. <coughs> Commissioner Bertran. Bertrand. Bertrand. Here. Commissioner Kaufman Gomez. Present. And Commissioner Lowe. All right, we uh, decided to hold uh, uh, today's transportation policy workshop uh, in this room rather than the small room at the RTC because uh, we wanted to make sure to be available uh, for people to provide testimony about today's item. There is a closed session which we do not need uh, this morning and won't be holding a closed session. Um, uh, next, uh, we'll move on to oral communications. Uh, this is a time to, uh, to address the Transportation Commission about items under our purview. You'll have three minutes. Uh, good morning, commissioners and <clears throat> RTC staff and members of the public. I hope your day is really beautiful so far. Um, my name is Jack Nelson, and <laughs> commissioners, I know you um, absorb a lot of reports, and I, I have one with me here this morning. This is a nine pounder. It's uh, climate Change 2013, the Physical Science Basis. This is a report that the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change uh, issued in 2013. And I've, I've brought it with me uh, just as a kind of physical manifestation of the profound depth of understanding we have today as human beings of climate change uh, on our planet Earth. Um, but this is especially timely because uh, a week ago, Monday, the IPCC issued a special update report on, on this report. And um, there, there are a few headline takeaways from that report that came out a week ago, Monday. Uh, did you read about it in the Sentinel? Uh, actually, no, because the Sentinel hasn't yet covered it. Um, but what the scientists of this global community of uh, researchers is telling us is that um, we've got a problem. We need to cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 45 percent by 2030 if, if we would like to not have catastrophic climate change happening by 2040. Uh, they've put a box around how much more carbon we human beings can emit. It's, it's very limited. And then the question becomes, well, who can emit that? under a just system of governance, who gets to emit that? Is it the people who've already emitted the most or should it be the people who still need to emit it in order to have water, food, uh, light, a place to live, all that? So um, where does that go? Um, there could also be an ounce report of moral persuasion, and, and I suppose that's what I'm also attempting to bring to you, is that you all have moral action in your hearts, and I hope that you will find a way to look into what the IPCC is telling us, because it's of crucial importance to all of our futures. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Brett Garrett. I, I, I'll just share a flash of inspiration that I had on Tuesday when I was on the bus going to Watsonville during rush hour, and I was thinking, wouldn't it be neat if all these cars got out of the way so that the bus could go through? Um, so I had this vision of a little flashing yellow light on the front of the bus that shows up in the rear view mirror that says, yield to bus. And the bus driver could use this at his discretion when there's a place that the car could pull over and get out of the way. And the car, there could be like this wave of cars making way for the bus to get through. And um, that would be really cool. So I did a Google search for the idea yield for the bus. And I found out that many communities have a yield for the bus law, which is actually different from what I proposed, but it could be an addition, which is that when the bus is pulled over trying to get back into traffic, people have to yield for the bus, um, which is also a good idea. Anyway, thank you. Thanks. Good morning. Good morning, Gail McNulty, Greenway. Um, 
the new United Nations climate change report or the updated report that Jack mentioned is incredibly scary. I'm a mother, I have three kids, and I'm thinking about their future, and I'm quite honestly petrified. River Street may not reach Jack Nelson's underwater photo stage during this century, but it's quite possible that our mountain communities and maybe even our cities will face unsta unbearable heat, unstoppable forest fires, and endless drought during many of our lifetimes, more or less our children's. We need to pause and think about what this means for our children and our grandchildren. We could pool all of our local resources and build a massive wall around our county to try to keep this change from coming. Or we can try to think critically about changes that we can afford to implement now that could offer climate-friendly options today and adaptability tomorrow. We all love trains, but pouring a ton of money, even if we had it, into a massive, unmovable transportation infrastructure project that crosses eroding cliffs may not be the wisest plan. Buses are far more adaptable. Bicycle infrastructure is relatively low cost and can be easily changed. Our climate is rapidly changing and our transportation options are rapidly evolving. Ryan Evans, the CEO of Inboard Technologies, spoke about our transportation revolution on June 14th. Jump bikes, scooters, the sharing economy, these things will change how we get around. Joby, Inboard, One Wheel, Blix, Gazelle are already based here. If we build a truly safe active transportation network, more of these forward-thinking companies may choose to locate in our county, bolstering our local economy and bringing countless job opportunities. We need nimble planning that prioritizes human-powered modes and equal-friendly buses now to dramatically reduce our greenhouse gas emissions as soon as possible. And we need to keep our thinking open to take advantage of emerging technologies. We are clearly a community filled with people who care and want to do the right thing. And we can find common ground if we take the time to try. Our stars have aligned, measure defunds can be matched, and we're about to have a new executive director at the helm of this agency. And Santa Cruz County is uniquely set to take center stage of this revolution if we just open our eyes before the opportunity passes us by. With some creative thinking and some heroic leadership, Santa Cruz County can set the bar for mid-sized communities around the world, hoping to get transportation right. It's time to have a positive impact on the future of humanity, and we can do it right here. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Harry Pico. So I believe uh, this study, I, I want the if commission you're to talk about the unified quarter study. We have an item about that. I thought this was. No, this is the oral communications. Uh, then I have nothing to say. Okay. <laughs> is there anyone else for oral communications about items not on today's agenda? Uh, seeing none, uh, we'll move to see if there's any additions or deletions to the agenda. Mr. Dondero. Uh, <clears throat> yes, Mr. Chairman, we have uh, two handouts for item 10. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have one item or two items on our uh, consent agenda. Uh, does anybody want to make any comment or make a motion? I make a, move, a motion that we can approve the consent agenda. <coughs> motion by Schifrin. Second. Seconded by McPherson. Um, all in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion carries unanimously. Then we will move on to our. Chair? Yeah. Yep, yeah, please. Thank you. I, I don't see any. Uh, we don't have an item typically for the regular commission meetings. We have commissioner reports. I just, I just have one comment to make, and, and it's regarding a, um, a Sentinel article that came out after our last meeting. It incorrectly represented some of the timelines that we're looking here, and I want to make sure that, it's, that we correct that for the record. Uh, Did I miss the Octo It's an October 4th Santa Cruz Sentinel article, uh, Santa Cruz County RTC corridor study decision may be December 6th. In it, it says that uh, a 90-day shot clock regarding the buy a buyout of the progressive rail contract starts with the staff recommendation. And the, the actual timeline, once we receive um, upon completion of the study, there's a 120-day period 
within which if we don't make a decision after that 120 days, progressive rail has the right to walk away from the agreement. That $300,000 buyout that's mentioned in the article is only triggered if we choose not to, and to not to maintain freight service between mile point zero and mile point seven. So it's very specific um, and it is misrepresented in the similar article. So I don't see Jondi here, but anyway, that was it. Yeah, thank you. Um, so item 10 is the unified quarter study uh, draft step two scenario out analysis discussion. Um, I know we've, uh, we've had a, a number of uh, community meetings already this week. Uh, Mr. Dondera, you want to introduce this item? Yes, thank you. Um, since beginning to work on the Unified Corridor Study in se December 2016, uh, almost two years ago, uh, staff and the Commission have conducted 28 meetings, workshops, focus group sessions, stakeholder group sessions, as well as several online surveys. Uh, and will be completed by December 6th of this year. Work on the modeling tools was accomplished between 2012 and 2015 and was presented at nine different meetings. Staff is answering questions submitted by the public through our extensive outreach process as quickly as possible and posting those answers on the frequently asked questions page on the RTC website. Staff is making presentations to all four city councils and the Metro Board uh, this week and I believe the following two weeks after. Uh, we would like to remind everyone that the purpose of the study is to help the Commission determine a clear direction for future transportation investments. The outcome of this process will provide a big picture perspective to guide current and future Commissioners as they shape the evolving transportation <coughs> system. Embedded in the selection of a preferred scenario are forces that will shape the quality of life in this county for decades to come. This is especially germane to any effort to improve the housing situation, which I know is getting a lot of attention these days. When digesting a work of this magnitude, it is easy to get lost in details. The point of the study is to establish a clear policy, not to make decisions about design details of future projects. And uh, I say this because uh, we've gotten lots of these very detailed type questions at some of our um, outreach meetings. It also, um, completing the study also fulfills our commitment to the voters as stated in Measure D to make a determination about future use of the rail right away. Many of the details included are assumptions based on best practices in the industry, past work of the RTC, and knowledge of local conditions and preferences. It should be understood that many of these details are subject to change when a project reaches the design stage. What is important to focus on is the outcomes, the performance metrics for each scenario. So we suggest that it is very useful to ask which metrics are important to you. And I'll hand that off to Frederick. Frederick Bettner, our consultant from Kimley Horn. Good morning. Thank, thank you, George. Good morning. So um, we don't really have a presentation. I think George has uh, made the, um, you know, the statement of where we are. I think this is a Q&A session. Um, just wanted to emphasize extensive outreach already, nine meetings. There's another five coming up. Um, you know, so this um, wanted to see if you have qu questions or comments. And you know, I'll take the questions, try to respond. And if I need the team members, we'll call them to the dais and we'll take it from there. And then we also have um, our um, economic consultants is on the phone as well if there's any economic questions. Okay, well, thank you. Um, for, uh, I attended the uh, public meeting uh, this past Monday. I thought there was a very good presentation, very good uh, turnout. Um, there were some good questions and there was a, a great community conversation about, uh, about the different scenarios. So I appreciated the work that you did there. Um, now I'll look to see if members of the commission have questions. Uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. So we got a handout just recently with some changes. Uh, this is on page 100 of the, of the study. And the handout changes, uh, let's just go to scenario A, high occupancy vehicle lanes, HOV. The previous one that has apparently been corrected uh, high occupancy was 
uh, 5,400,000, do you see that, top left? Second one down? Yep. 5,400,000. The new one is 8,400,000. I did a little math because, um, you know, what's going on? Okay, so I did a little math, and that's a 55% uh, percent difference in terms of costs, okay. So my, here's my question. You know, you, you had about a year and a half or a year and two months to study this extensively to come up with reliable information, yet in the last, since we've met, uh, it's changed 55%. The increase has gone up from 5.4 million to 8.4. Help me understand why. So it was based on comments that we got back um, about being reflective and being um, open about O&M costs. And this one specifically relates to Highway 1 um, maintenance, and I'll let uh, Grace explain. That, that's basically it. So, Grace, you want to? Um, yeah, good point. Thanks for pointing that out, that there's been a revision to uh, the, it's the operations and maintenance cost estimates and how that's reflected also in the dashboard. So the change there looks at the inclusion of the cost associated with maintaining the roadway on Highway 1 um, to provide more of a comparison against uh, the cost for maintaining other facilities. It also includes the cost for maintaining the buffered bike lanes. We do assume that those costs, if um, you do look at the third row, um, third column. Um, there, so for each scenario, there's a cost column, there's a funding potential column, and then there's a new public investment column. So for the third column, you'll see that it's no additional cost. That column has not changed <coughs> because we do assume that it's funded, continues to be funded by Caltrans, the cost for maintaining the highway lanes. So what transpired for, for this new information for you to make this decision to, to change this figure? Basically the comment that, um, did you include the Highway 1 cost um, as a cost for RTC? Um, initially the thought was it's gonna be a Caltrans cost because Caltrans operates and maintains uh, the highway facility. Um, but to show it as a true cost reflection, um, uh, that's why we uh, decided to include it afterwards. So it does beg the question, and the question is, what else wasn't asked? What else wasn't included in terms of coming up with reliable information that gives us confidence in this study? Mm -hmm. I mean, if, if this can change to millions of dollars in one week, what else is out there that we don't know about? That's a fair question, don't you think? It's a fair question, and we have lots of questions like that, and we're gonna prepare responses, and if those questions are such that we, we think we should include it in the documentation, or is it that we should present it, and it, um, then we will surely do that. So the next question I would have, given the fact that this changed so dramatically, is why wouldn't we want a peer review of your work? That's a, that's a, that's a board, that's a, a council or commission decision. Fair enough. Uh, just to be clear, uh, this is, uh, the, the, the difference is really $100,000 to what our responsibilities would be, not, uh, there were some, there are yeah. some additional numbers, but there's also additional funding. There was no uh, proposed uh, funding support from Caltrans before. That's it. it um, yeah. And so it went from 5.4 to 5.5 uh, okay. as part of this. Um, and so we had, uh, so uh, we, we used, you got a better cost estimate, but you also identified a, a, a funding source to pay for that additional yeah. cost, or most of it. Yep. It was just a being more transparent in reflecting the information that the cost for RTC would still be exactly as it was presented in the first version. Or close to it, I yeah, think. I think it was 5.4 to 5.5. All right, are there other questions? Mr. Mulhorn. Uh, thank you very much. Um, which revenue streams or sources did you identify that could be used in support of transit operations, bus or rail? Good, I'm gonna ask Grace to do that. So, so to, as Grace comes up, so what we um, looked at was basically across the board from federal, state, 
um, sources, um, anything that we know is available. It's also pretty consistent with regional transportation planning as it stands out there right now. And, uh, but I'll let Grace talk a little more, but that's the big picture of where the funding sources come Thank from. Thank you, yes, the, the specific, specific funding sources, please. Yeah. Certainly. Um, so there's several different transit projects, as you know, in the Unified Corridor Study. Operations, please. Uh, specific to, uh, yeah, for operations. Yeah, so operations. there's the bus rate rapid transit light on SoCal operation costs, as well as the passenger rail operation costs. The, the revenue sources, please. Right, I, I'm, I'm trying to explain that for each of those particular projects, new transit revenues, fares, would be generated, okay. and how that was distributed was only to those particular projects. So if the bus rapid transit on SoCal generated new transit fares, only the transit fares associated with that new project were distributed as a potential revenue for that source. In addition, um, the state transportation assistance uh, funds um, were applied to as a revenue for operating and distributed across the three different transit projects depending on the scenario. Consistent with the RTC policy adopted last December to make some of those funds available as discretionary. There was no change in assumption about the existing funding sources that are going to Metro, that those could would continue to go to Metro for their existing services, although some of them, the commission could decide some of them could be directed to um, new transit projects. That was not assumed here. So the the increase the increase in transit operation revenue comes from fare box revenues. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Other questions, uh, Mr. Schifrin. I have uh, uh, a number of questions and comments, but I prefer to hear from the public before bringing them up. That's okay, okay. Um, then I'll just ask uh, uh, Ms. Huff, uh, Kaufman Gomez. Thank you. Um, <coughs> I'm assuming this is on. I'm not hearing any yeah, feedback on. on it. Um, one question that comes up frequently, first of all, um, to let the audience know and, and on the record, I've met a uh, couple hours with RTC prior to the workshop in Watsonville, and uh, I've gone through this extensively with them. Um, they know what questions I've sent of them, many of which will show up in the FAQ and in the dialogue that I've had with them um, firsthand on the knowledge. But what keeps circling back to me in, in terms of public comments that I would like to make sure um, can be very well understood is, can you explain what we've done to get to this point um, for the peer review process? Because it keeps coming back as like, we need a peer review process. And I, I know that we've got extensive reports, what you've used from the data from these reports, and can you explain what that was in terms of necess necessitating a peer review? versus all of the reports and, and uh, collective findings that you've done to put this UCIS study together? So um, as we've developed the, the materials that are in front of you today um, is we have internal, so just within Kim Lee Horn, uh, peer review of the numbers. And then the second set of peer review was then again with the staff as well to so check the back check it and, you know, things that go back to the RTP, projects that goes back to the CIPs, um, you know, refining the numbers, relooking them on the cost estimates. We've had various inputs um, as we started out a year ago. We know cost estimates came in for the construction of, the, uh, of, of segment seven, it came in higher. We used some of those, another bid came in, new bids uh, for constructing bridges. So as more data came available, we refined the numbers um, continuously throughout the process. Um, Ginger Dyker, pl Transportation Planner, RTC staff. Uh, part of this process was for the Unified Corridor Study was bringing information together from studies that have already been developed. A lot of these projects that are before you in the various different scenarios are not projects that we're talking about for the first time, for the majority of them. And um, very much the Unified Corridor Study is a compilation of information that has been developed from various different plans over the years. The Monterey Bay Sanctuary Scenic Trail Plan, the um, Rail Feasibility Study, the Highway 1 Environmental Impact Report, that is draft right now. So in a sense, this Unified Carter study is a peer review process of information that has already been brought to the commission and um, we're bringing this together in a, in a um, compiled document before you to help prioritize our decisions in the future. Thank you. 
And, and isn't it also your, uh, you, you've been meeting with the uh, technical, uh, our interagency technical committee, which is made up of public works directors from all the cities and the county who are also reviewing the document um, and get, you're getting their input on this? Okay. Correct, yes, and Metro as well on, on a lot of the uh, bus and uh, transit service. And our partner agencies as well. Okay. Um, then I think we'll open it up uh, for uh, members of the public uh, to speak. Uh, let's get a show of hands of how many people uh, want to speak. Uh, I'm going to give them three minutes because uh, they're, they're dedicated and, and come here this morning. Good morning again. I'm Jack Nelson. Um, so given what you just heard about information coming in from other reports, I'd like to mention the Highway 1 draft EIR. That's cited in this study as one of the sources of information. Uh, this current study assumes that some aux lanes, auxiliary lanes, excuse me, will be built on Highway 1. That's like part of the baseline, but what that means is this study doesn't ask the question, well, will that get us something good for our money? And that draft EIR and this study, neither of them considers one of the most important factors you should be considering, which is induced travel. Induced travel is the idea that when you, uh, in this case, add a freeway lane to a congested freeway, you will get new trips, you will get diverted trips, you'll get longer trips. Uh, people will choose to use this new resource that you're um, using public dollars to open up. And what happens is uh, it's like having an interest charge on your loan. Uh, it costs you something. And the state of California has issued technical guidance on this April 2018 from the Office of Planning and Research. They're telling agencies such as yours and your consultants to include induced travel in your considerations. So if there were any peer review coming from the Office of Planning and Research, State of California, I think they'd say, you guys need to go back to the drawing board and include this factor in your considerations because uh, I respectfully submit that what would happen was those freeway lanes would fade out in their performance. And as I mentioned about climate change, we really need to fix greenhouse gas emissions in this county, and where are they? Uh, they're driven by this paradigm of autocentric development that your commission has the hand on the steering wheel for. So my question to you is, will you consider induced travel in this study? And that will change your results. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and I just want to encourage everybody to focus on, on the actual study and, uh, and uh, the issues uh, in the different scenarios therein. Good morning. Good morning, Chair Leopold and fellow commissioners. My name is Mark Masidi Miller. I'm a professional civil engineer with more than three decades of experience and the board chair of the Friends of the Rail and Trail. I trust each of you has received and reviewed the statement from the Friends of the Rail and Trail explaining why we think Scenario B is the clear winner. One of the important results of the UCS is that the Rail and Trail Scenario B is markedly safer than all other scenarios. The UCS predicts the Rail and Trail Scenario B will result in 118 fewer motor vehicle, bicycle, and pedestrian collisions every year when compared to the trail only scenario A, 114 fewer than the bus heavy scenario C, and 109 fewer than the extravagant scenario E. That is about one less collision every three days. Not only will our county be safer under the rail and trail scenario B, we will save more than $24 million every year as well. As reported in yesterday's Santa Cruz Sentinel, Santa Cruz County was the first county in the entire state to win the Gold Beacon Award. Congratulations. That award was granted for our collective commitment to cutting back on greenhouse gas emissions, saving energy, and adopting policies that promote environmental sustainability. Here again, the rail and trail scenario B 
shines with the UCS predicting that scenario B will reduce vehicle miles traveled by 230,000 miles every single day, 84 million miles every single year when compared to the trail only scenario A. Finally, when it comes to economic vitality, the rail with trail scenario B was the only scenario to score straight A's across every economic performance metric. Given our community's commitment to make choices that perform well against the triple bottom line, the UCS makes it crystal clear that when it comes to people, planet, and prosperity, the rail and trail scenario B is the superior choice. And one thing that's been omitted from the, uh, the uh, UCS is the integration with the state rail plan, which was just adopted last month by the state, which envisions transforming California into the Switzerland of North America. Our rail line is part of the state rail plan. Can you imagine car-free travel throughout California? Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. This, this is new, for, this is my second time. This is new for me, so excuse me. Um, I have looked at the different scenarios. Personally, I like scenario B. The houses across the street from me, the rail line is behind <coughs> their houses. So, and I think that it would be great <coughs> if the the city of Santa Cruz and all the city in our whole county adopts scenario B. And I think it's great because it includes our special needs community. It in includes um, elders who no longer can drive. Maybe they're still able-bodied. They can still walk, but possibly their licenses have been taken away from them, maybe from uh, they're blind or they're getting blind. Um, also, millennials. We're not talking about millennials. A lot of millennials don't want to drive. They want to take mass transit. Also, um, young parents with children and strollers, they can roll their strollers right into uh, a light rail or a trolley or tram, whatever we envision for the future. And our South County residents, they'll be able to use mass transit from going from Watsonville up to Capitola, Aptos, Santa Cruz, or the west side. And the la that, the West East Corridor is the last corridor that is open that is not Highway 1. And I think it would be great to be inclusive, include the trail, but let's not forget the rail, and let's include all of our um, residences, you know, resident here in Santa Cruz County. And lastly, I feel that Scenario B offers four Earlier, the people I mentioned, especially the young, poor, elderly, special needs, uh, it offers them dignity, independence, and a way for them to have some autonomy. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Brett Garrett. Um, I'll just, I, I find myself questioning a lot of the, the information in the Unified Corridor Study. Um, for example, when I'm comparing scenarios B and C, um, the train versus the bus rapid transit, um, one, one thing I don't understand is how it is that the, the bus rapid transit is running every 15 minutes, the train is running every half hour, but you end up with a lot more transit vehicle miles traveled for the train than the bus rapid transit. I, I, I don't understand that. Um, it looks like they're adding a lot of extra bus service to go along with the train to support the train. Um, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't see that spelled out in the way that the scenarios were, were brought up at the beginning, but when I look at the report, I see they've added a lot of extra buses to support the train, but nothing to support the bus rapid transit. So I, I think it's, um, unfairly biased in favor of the train instead of the bus rapid transit. Um, I also think um, that in addition to bus rapid transit, we should be looking at another scenario involving personal rapid transit um, that has not been, I, 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 we're talking about half billion dollars of projects and to not do the due diligence of looking in detail at a project that appears to meet all the goals much better than any of the scenarios is a concern for me. I mean, I, I just think we really need to look at this. I'll, I'll pass these out to you. Um, 
this is this. I, I tend to favor the versions of this uh, PRT that are a little bit futuristic, but there are systems operating now. The one the one in Morgantown, West Virginia, has been offering operating since the 70s. There's one at the Heathrow Airport. Um, this uh, a, a version of PRT could be built in the next three years in Santa Cruz County if our community decided we wanted to do it, um, and it would. Pretty much, I believe it would pay the operating expenses just by collecting fares. It's it's so much cheaper to run. The the greenhouse gases are lower. Um, it's safer for all modes. It's you show up at the station and it's probably waiting for you instead of having to wait for the train. So please give this some consideration. Thank you very much. Good morning. Hi. Good morning, uh, I'm David Van Brink. I live on the west side of Santa Cruz, been here for a few decades. Um, so for the last year and you know, I guess a lot more, the parameters and metrics of this uh, unified corridor analysis have been open and transparent. Uh, two of the scenarios, including one with passenger rail, was eliminated early. Mm -hmm. uh, for the last year and more, some people at each uh, you know, trivial mundane step of the way, like uh, negotiating a parking lot with New Leaf or uh, rail custodial operations, some people have said, oh no, stop, stop, do nothing until the corridor study is complete. Well, now we have the draft of the corridor study and you know, some people are saying, oh, oh no, 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 this, these scenarios are all wrong, they've been rigged or whatever and uh, we should start over. So I would just say, you know, we have the draft here, if it needs revisions, so be it, let's you know, iterate, let's follow the process um, and let's continue with the process, let's not be derailed from you know, our long-term plans. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, if people could line up, uh, otherwise we could uh, shorten the time for people to speak. So um, I actually think the study was well done. However, it was done countywide and it lost complete focus on the north-south purpose of the whole study. It's about, if you look at your webpage, it's north-south transportation or travel. So when you do that, everything's lost. And so the costs, uh, so what's lost is, for example, key data such as CO2 savings, it's 15 to one having an HOV versus a train, if you do the, if, uh, by that. The time delay in your own studies, 49 minutes delay if you don't build, 49 minutes if you have the auxiliary lanes which we're building, or I assume, and then zero minute delay if you have an HOV lane. These are your studies, not mine. Uh, the costs are skewed. You, I keep hearing about this $41 million. This is an example that we have to repay. That includes t uh, $11 million, which is actually 10.2. I really resent that. 10.2 of Proposition 116 funds, plus the increased cost of what the real estate has appreciated, which is completely false. You pay back the 10.2. If the property value went down, are they going to say, oh, you have to pay less? No, they're going to make you pay exactly what you borrowed. So I really think that's skewed and uh, it doesn't include parking structures, doesn't include the infrastructure that you really need. So what I'm saying is you got, it's packaged in a way to where it makes it seem like, and by the way, it's not for the commissioners, it's coming from the office. So I want uh, you guys to understand, this is coming from them. Um, so the HOV, uh, it included all the streets, that the, the UCS uh, study included all the streets from Tampico to Eureka Canyon. Okay, Anna Street in Watsonville. Um, the train affects only about 3,000 people. HOV lane affects people stuck in traffic 30 to 50,000 daily. So, uh, and that's in each direction, by the way. And lastly, people worry about induced traffic from your own HOV study. HOV does not stimulate unplanned growth. And let's see if there's anything else. Oh yeah, train times from point A to point B have never been discussed in this whole thing. I early on went through and figured out if I were in Watsonville, I would take 10 minutes to get to the, the station, five minutes to wait. I would take 43 minutes to get to my point B, then I would wait five minutes to get onto the bus, then I would take the bus another 20 minutes, and it adds up to about an hour and a half, whereas it took me about 35, 40 minutes to get downtown from Aptos. Okay, that's what happened today, and there was a lot of traffic. So we tend to think that traffic's really bad, but it's really in small locations. And if you want to affect the, the, the betterment of the majority of people who travel that, I hate to say it, lane widening is the way to go. And, and I'm actually not 
a fan of all those things either. So go ahead. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Sally Arnold. Um, I've lived in the county since 1976 and I've been following with great interest this whole process for about the last 20 years. Very excited to finally get a rail trail. Um, I'm kind of nervous. Um, <laughs> I, um, I went through the UCIS page by page. I had a lot of questions and c comments and um, I'm gonna, I know I only have two or three minutes here, but I wanna hand you, I'm gonna make some statements that are sort of like summaries what I saw in the UCIS, but I have references to the pages so people can like see, like back up my assertions. So, um, So after going through the UCIS, um, it seems clear that option B is the best for our county for safety, for efficiency, for ecology, for economy, for expediency. Um, option B is good, but I think it could be made, or made better with three changes. Highway one. Um, you know, on page 84, table 32 shows that the commute time on highway one remains essentially the same no matter what we do. Um, it looks like, you know, you can throw a lot of money at that, but you can't really improve the situation because of induced travel that um, other people have already spoken about. So I would forget the ramp metering, I'd forget the auxiliary lanes, that money can be better spent elsewhere. Um, I think I'm concerned about the, sh the Mission Street focus, it, sound, it was unclear for me from reading the study, but it seemed like the focus for those improvements had to do with moving cars faster on Mission Street. Now I will say, I live off of Mission Street, I drive it all the time, and true confessions, I'm somewhat of a lead foot myself, but I don't think, we can, we're never gonna get uh, Mission Street to run at freeway travel times, and I think we just need to give it up. It's only about two miles, we could just slow it down and make it better for pedestrians and cyclists. It's, right now, it's, um, you know, it's a commercial district surrounded by residential neighborhoods, but it's really unpleasant to walk on and it's really unsafe to cross. And um, I think trying to make it faster is not gonna improve any of that. It's just gonna make it harder for people to get to the businesses because you get afraid to even break to turn into a business because there's all this traffic coming at 40 miles an hour behind you. Um, the, um, and the third thing I think that could be done to make in scenario B better is um, to run, I don't understand why, but for some reason scenario E has freight on the tracks, but B does not. Um, and I, it's unclear to me why that choice was made. I mean, if we're preserve, if we bought the right, right of way and we're preserving the tracks, why don't we use them to their top capacity? Especially since the, according to the UCIS, the, it's got economic, environmental, and safety benefits over trucking. So I don't see why we don't do that. I'm also concerned, and this leads me into three questions I have. Um, if we eliminate freight service, does that somehow affect our rail easement? Um, and do we now put ourselves in the position of having to rebuy that easement? I'm not sure about that. And um, just uh, the- Thank you. And also, um, if we tear up the tracks for A and C, I think that might also affect our rail easement. I don't know if that cost was accounted for. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Commissioner Leopold and uh, other commissioners. Um, I'm Bud Colligan. Uh, the first thing I'd like to say is that I think the study has a lot of good data in it. And uh, particularly on pages 99 and 100, I think you'll find a very useful tables for mixing and matching uh, different investments that we have to consider for our transportation future. Uh, the benefits are mostly equal across all the scenarios, A, B, C, and E. Um, so frankly, most of the benefits aren't much better than the baseline, which is disappointing, <laughs> but true according to the study. Um, we just passed Measure D, and I don't think there's a big appetite for a lot more taxes at this point. Um, we're up to the statutory limit with almost all the sales taxes after sales taxes that are currently on the ballot uh, that it will pass in November. Um, so I think there's a mix of investments, and I just passed out a, uh, a paper that we just had completed by Alta Planning uh, and Design, and it shows on Highway 1, uh, I think the bus on shoulder uh, proposal is the biggest bang for the buck. We're already investing in auxiliary lanes. Metro has shown us that bus on shoulder is possible. On Soquel and Freedom, across the board, 
the investments that are listed there of um, BRT light, buffered bike and, uh, pr and protected bike lanes and intersection improvements for auto, they go across most of the scenarios and they're mostly funded. So that would seem to be low hanging fruit as well. And of course on the rail corridor, I uh, support trail only. I think the biggest innovation that we've had in transportation in Santa Cruz County in the last 10 or 15 years hasn't come from the RTC. It's come from the city of Santa Cruz with jump bikes. Unleashing the creativity and individuality to do things quickly and take advantage of technology is what is going to improve transportation in this county in the next 10 years. And it's very inexpensive to do it. Um, so that's where I would focus. And finally, I would say in terms of a peer review, um, we spent about $4,000 a page if you exclude the uh, table of contents on this study. That's a lot of money. We shouldn't be rushing to conclude quickly. We should be trying to address the core problems that we have. Traffic congestion on Highway 1, bikes and pedestrians, uh, cyclists and pedestrians being killed, and the maintainability of our infrastructure over time. So the Alta paper really addresses those things, and it also shows that the trail-only solution is really about 98 million, not 219 million as proposed. So a peer study is really needed in this area and in other areas where there are major discrepancies of cost in the plan. Thank, Thank you. you. Is this the last speaker or there are other people who want to speak? Okay, I just encourage you to line up. Good morning, my name's Jack Carroll. At uh, Tuesday's RTC meeting, I learned that this uh, study uh, used the 2015 rail feasibility study for its train statistics. If you remember, on page 110 of that study, the maximum number of passengers at any time was predicted to be only 64 people on a train. 64 people maximum on a train at any one time. That's a ridiculously small number of train passengers and cannot in any way justify the enormous expense of regular passenger train service in Santa Cruz County. There is no traffic benefit to taking only 64 people off Santa Cruz roads, not necessarily even Highway 1. The current study tells us that a bicycle path would cost $219 million. I learned that this is based on Caltrans specifications, but my reading of the Caltrans specifications, uh, they allow lots of local flexibility. So some decisions had to be made to come up with that number. The Pedestrian and Bicycle Information Center reports an average cost of only $4 million for a 30-mile bike path. That's a very big gap between the two numbers. Adding a train will cost $400 million more that re represents half the total cost of scenario B. Do you think a train provides half the benefits of scenario B? Yes, it'll cost $40 million to return the train money, but that's less than 400 million. And people who say never remove the tracks evidently don't know that this plan removes all the tracks plus two thirds of the ties the tracks get replaced in this plan. That's why it costs so much. Please revise this report with a realistic cost for the bike path alone and incorporate the dismal statistics for a passenger train. Remember that you do not have funding in place for this wasteful spending and you cannot expect another Measure D to pass when these facts are available. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning, Marty DeMere, North Coast resident. Um, I can't improve on the comments of the previous speaker and also Mr. Colgan's remarks. Um, I've just been frustrated reading this um, UCIS and looking at all these estimates and projections and wishing that I could have just walked away with a comparison of say, how much does a trail cost? How much does a train cost? Uh, the other thing that's been frustrating in the meetings that I've attended is that actions are taken after the close of public comment. And as Mr. Schiffer reminded me, saying that he didn't want to offer his comments till after public comment. 
but then we, the public, do not get to respond to the changes that may come up as your board processes this. And I think that's um, troubling for me because there's things that happen after the close of comment that I think are worthy of comment. And I would encourage this board, if you're gonna take significant actions in regards to this study, that you reopen public comment so that people can respond to those changes. Thank you. Thank you. And just for clarification's sake, we're taking no action today. This is just that we're, we're receiving comments. I would add there'd be other opportunities for public comment. Yes, so that we, we have uh, a number of sessions scheduled. Good morning, commissioners. My name is Pierre Cannon from Ecology Action. And given that there's gonna be um, time for more public comment, my, my comments are gonna be pretty much focused on two areas of, of the plan. So the, the first area is the Capitola um, Bridge trestle in terms of the plan we have um, trail with rail. I would request that um, that would include um, putting that um, trail with rail across the Capitol trussel. Um, that area is an urbanized area of the county. Um, you know, as the study shows, it goes segment by segment where there are crashes, crashes that involve um, pedestrians and, and cyclists. You know, that's a pretty, a fairly high crash area. So you could um, reduce, reduce crashes by putting um, pedestrians and cyclists on the Capitol trussel. I know it's an expensive um, endeavor, even it hasn't been priced out, but you know, that's, that's the assumption. But um, given that we're undertaking this rather, you know, expensive project, the, the rail trail, that this, this part of it seems like it's worthy of, of being looked at and put in the current study as, as you move forward. And then the other item also is to deal with um, bike infrastructure, and those are the protected buffered bike lanes on Soquel and Freedom Corridor. We'd request that the um, consultants and the study team look at where they would put protected bike facilities, because there's a difference between a protected bike lane and a buffeted. A buffeted basically is paint on the ground. It's, it's more of a um, distance between um, car and, and cyclist rather than a regular bike lane, but it's still just paint on the ground. And that studies have shown that that does not get the net new cyclists who are able to ride but are uncomfortable doing in traffic riding. What gets new cyclists riding is having a physical barrier in a protected bike lane. So if you know, they could look at what locations along that long corridor from Santa Cruz to Watsonville, Soquel Freedom um, Corridor would, should have protected bike lanes. Um, that would be great because I, I don't know if the $12 million figure would hold up because my understanding is that they didn't look at the physical barrier separated bike lanes on Soquel. And that was also you know, something in the study that is designed, it seemed like, to increase safety, reduce um, pedestrian, well, reduce bicycle crashes, and then also get more people riding their bicycles. So there's a big distinction between a physically separated um, path and a a paint on the, on the pavement. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Hi, my name is Ron Goodman. Um, I'm not gonna talk about whether or not uh, you should have the rail, the tracks there or not, but what I wanted to comment about was after looking through the UCS study, I was concerned that the bus rapid transit wasn't fairly evaluated. Um, I did talk with the consultants at some of the meetings that we've had over the last few days and they commented that a lot of the concerns I have would come out in an operational study. And my concern is that there hasn't been an operational study. So I'm just gonna talk about what some of those things are. So one, bus routes can be optimized for point to point service. Um, the train doesn't go near the university, Cabrillo College, the hospital, the Soquel Corridor, so it means that you have to have bus connectors, which means you have to have one or two transfers depending upon where you're going, and buses allow you to scale a lot more easily. You can start in a location, and as the system grows, you can add more buses with more and more point connections. As Hensher and Mully, the authors of the most cited study that compare uh, bus rapid transit to light rail wrote, they said blind commitment for light rate light rail train has caused many cities to overlook the potential for more cost-effective bus-based systems. People have just used the term train to mean good transit and buses to mean bad transit, and that this perception is easily overcome. So I hope you guys can think about that too. 
Um, BRT is an extension of bus service. It allows regular buses to bypass congestion when it's possible. You can have buses that use a corridor in one direction when the traffic is bad in that direction and switch the other way. A study in France by Steery Davies Gleaves found that when they compared bus rapid transit and light rail in their community, that bus rapid transit was preferred. Um, I have all the studies are here. Um, there are acceleration and deceleration benefits, which might sound like a small technical issue, but on the west side of Santa Cruz, for example, if you have a train that's going every 300 feet, there's an intersection, and so either the train continues at full speed through those intersections, which currently don't have controls, or they have to stop, and trains take a lot longer to stop than buses. Buses can be electric, which means you can also have very quiet trains, um, and, uh, Noise, there are a lot of noise concerns that people have. I'm not sure that those concerns are necessarily um, critical, but certainly electric buses solve that problem. Buses are very fault tolerant. If there's a problem with the train tracks, there needs to be a repair, you've lost your entire system. Buses, however, can just move to a different street. They can go around construction. Um, they're about uh, half the cost. Um, I looked online and a number of studies compare the light rail to bus rapid transit cost, and, their, and bus rapid transit is always less or equal to, the, to that cost. Um, uh, I've got some more things, but looking at the time, I'll just close with Dr. Edward Glazer, professor of economics at Harvard, said in his Harvard X talk, 50 years of transportation economics at Harvard can be boiled down to four words, bus good, train bad. Um, I'm actually not against the train, but I really do think in our community we need to give the bus rail, bus rapid transit more of a look. Thank Thanks. you. Good morning. Hi. Gail McNulty. As most of you probably know, I'm not a transportation expert. Um, I don't know much about government. I'm just a mom, a, horror, a former high school teacher, and a terribly flawed human being who makes lots of mistakes and isn't afraid to say I'm sorry when I do. So I'm um, just saying that. So um, from a high school teacher standpoint, I'm, I'm grateful to the work that has gone into this study. I think that the staff and Kimberly Horn have fulfilled the assignment at hand. There's a ton of effort. I know a ton of time that went into this, um, and I'm grateful for that. And, and definitely a creative, um, an A for illustrations and creativity there. From a climate change standpoint, which we spoke about earlier, and also from an equity standpoint, I'm afraid that the assignment for this study lacked courage. Um, when I look at the when I look at the bar graphs and the colored charts in the document, Linda Wilhusen actually pointed out the same thing at a stakeholder meeting I was at with her yesterday. When we look at the CO2 page, I mean, they're flat. We, we're aiming to make a difference with the climate here and we're not doing it. And the reason we're not doing it is because we're trying to give everybody fair sh share. We, we want people driving cars to be happy and we want to give something to transit and we want to give something to bikes, but we're balancing it all out and, and we're doing that in a way that means we're not making a difference. Um, you know, Santa Cruz has a proud history of pioneering environmental change. We have amazing potential and we need to live up to our reputation. We have the possibility here. I mean, I, as a parent, I am scared to hell of what we're doing to this world, and there's not a lot of time to fix it, and we're not living up to our potential here as a county if we don't take the lead, because we've got businesses located here and more will come, and if we do this right, if we look to New York City, you know, the birthplace of bureaucracy, <laughs> And if they can in 30 days think of a plan to put in a protected bike lane and realize that plan, and if they know their subways are gonna shut down and they can paint the street and put in bus lanes, and they can do it by saying, you know what, we're gonna try this. And if it doesn't work, we can change it. If we can't live up to that potential here, there's something really wrong because we have a whole lot of people in this community that care and want to make a difference and our kids need us to step up and take the lead and we can do it or we can just shelve this study and we can let it go by and we can just assume that we're a little county and every little county is not going to, what can we do to make a difference? But if every little county in the world does that, we're all screwed, sorry. Thank well, you. And if you missed my op-ed, I'm going to hand out a couple copies of this because it talks Th exactly Thank you.
Good morning. Good morning, my name is Yannicka Strauss. I'm the director of Bike Santa Cruz County. Bike Santa Cruz County envisions a future where people of all ages and abilities are comfortable using their bikes for daily trips. And for the record, we don't already think that we are there. But consistent investment in infrastructure that improves the safety for bicyclists and gets people into transit, improves the community, it improves our health, it improves our accessibility and livability. And so we encourage you to please look at the scenario that gets the most people on bikes and gets the most people in transit because that is where our community is going. Thank you. Thank you. Please come forward. Is there anyone else who wants to speak? Uh, then this will be the last speaker. Hello, my name is Sean Schrum. I'm an advocate for the special needs and disabled community in Santa Cruz. Uh, any scenario, uh, any rail scenario uh, would include the needs of the disabled and special needs communities. 19 out of 100 Americans lives with a disability, and those communities are growing. And most members of those communities do not drive. What does 19 out of 100 of your friends, family, and neighbors look like? The disabled community needs people movers, safe, reliable transportation for the same reasons everybody else does. Any trail only scenario is exclusionary and ignores the needs of nearly a fifth of your county. We've all been taught since childhood to not stare at disabled people. Over a lifetime, that community has become invisible to you. Even these meetings are by nature exclusionary. Most people in that community do not drive and their time is often managed by others and keeping routine is important. Some quadriplegics that I know, eloquent and as, as accomplished as they are, need to be fed and helped into bed by the trained staff that they've handpicked to assist them. They can't be at a seven o'clock meeting. Getting here by nine is a huge challenge. Um, you have a choice to help people that have been invisible to you for a long time. These communities are growing. Autism spectrum disorder is on the rise. Amputations between 20s and 60s have doubled in the US. We're gonna see more veterans coming home. We need people movers. And a rail system will do more for um, school kids and our elders than a trail only will. And if you really wanna get some feedback, if you wanna know what's going on in South County, then address the largest professional organization in Watsonville, Pajaro Valley Educators. They know more about what's going on in the community than anybody does. They know what's going on with the residents and families, and they know what's right for Watsonville. Watsonville's a, Watsonville has grown up and should not be treated like the little, uh, the little kid in the family anymore. Watsonville people know what Watsonville needs. Thank you. Thank you. All right, well, we have one more speaker. Uh, is there anyone else? <laughs> <laughs> then, going once, going twice, this will be our last speaker. Great. Good morning, commissioners, Manu Koenig. Uh, and you know, my experience as it relates to this study is that uh, I've done studies for the county before, so I think they were more in the order of tens of thousands rather than hundreds of thousands, but I do definitely have some sympathy for our consultants um, and for you guys in absorbing the report. I did want to point out uh, a few things that seem like glaring uh, shortcomings. Um, maybe the first is that just in the at the presentation at Live Oak Elementary on Monday night, I found it very hard as a member of the public to really understand what the scenarios were uh, with the whole rainbow color coding thing. It wasn't until I saw this key that it sort of started to like, become clear to me. I talked to another uh, member of other members of the public that had a similar to uh, difficulty in understanding exactly what these scenarios mean. I think it'd be a lot uh, more transparent if we separate out the, the actual modes from the scenarios. So I don't know if any of you could tell me um, the, for example, 
uh, number of people that can move uh, with a bus on shoulder scenario and the cost you know, per transit mile for, or, or per passenger in that scenario. It seems, uh, you know, I can't compare that to uh, the same cost uh, for someone moved on a train. I, I can find the max uh, capacity of the proposed rail project. Um, so, so breaking it out by mode would be a lot clearer and it would allow us to recombine um, and find you know, the best uh, combination of modes. A few other glaring uh, shortcomings. Um, there's the, the, the net present value of each one of these scenarios. It's sort of, we assume that a person moved by rail transit 20 years from now is, that has the same value as you know, a bus system that could be implemented in five years. The reality is we, we have to apply more value to people that, or to, to uh, modes that can be implemented faster and can move people sooner. I mean, how many more people could be moved by the year 2035 with a bus system that's implement, or a bus on shoulder program implemented in five years versus a train program implemented 20 years from now. That is not accounted for anywhere in this report. Uh, we also have to look for um, you know, the max capacity of the system. There's a lot of uh, data that shows that a trail that is uh, you know, 14 feet wide can move uh, twice as many people at peak hours as one that's 8 to 12 feet wide. Again, these things are not accounted for uh, in the report. I think that um, this just shows why it's so necessary that we do a peer review on this study. Um, you know, uh, Kimberly Horn has done a great job, but again, this is a massive piece of work. It really needs a second set of eyes, um, and so I hope that uh, you will move for a peer review. Thank you. Thank you. Um, that being the end of our uh, public comments, I'll uh, see if Mr. Schifrin is ready now to make his comments. He is. Uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, I want to say that um, I want to appreciate the work that's been done by the consultants on this, trying to use the data that exists. If we had tried to fund collecting all new data, we'd be spending a huge amount of money, and we were already spending a lot of money. So the study isn't perfect. I think it's the best um, projections based on previous studies that were also imperfect. And in making projections, particularly, it's always uh, tricky because it's impossible to know what the future is going to bring. Um, having said that, I have a series of questions that I hope I can go through, uh, and the Commission will uh, sort of following up on the Commissioner Bertrand's uh, statement last time that he hoped commissioners would dive deeply into the study. And so I've, <coughs> I've read it fairly carefully and have a number of concerns and questions. First of all, I would like to ask staff to provide a list of projects for each scenario that are already in the Regional Transportation Plan because it's a little unclear to me how the, what the relationship is going to be between the Unified Corridor Study and the Regional Transportation Plan. The other thing that I want to clarify, uh, I think it's true, but I would like uh, our Executive Director to uh, answer this. The, the Commission approved the Step 1 scenarios, right? So the scenarios that we are seeing have been approved by the Commission. They didn't come from staff and they didn't come from the consultant. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Um, so then let me, I will go through this on page by page. I see that some commissioners have copies of it, uh, of the study, others uh, may not. But that's how I was able to make sort of sense out of it. On page 11, the, uh, the study talks about the Highway 1 EIR, Highway 1 Project EIR, and I was a little bit confused. It says that the EIR is to disclose the environmental effects of implementing near-term corridor improvements. It also looks at the long-term, the, the effects of long-term improvements, although at a programmatic level, and I think it's important to be clear that the, um, that, the, that the EIR is looking at both HOV lanes that are long-term and providing some uh, uh, analysis of those as well as the short-term ones. Okay. The other thing that's here is, uh, and I, I need to be reminded, it seems to say that it's on, the only tier two project that's being looked at is uh, one of the, auxil the auxiliary lane project, the 41st, Avenue is that is that the case? 
I thought it looked at the one from Bay to Park as well. As, does that mean that we're going to have to do, I know that for the uh, SoCal to 41st, if this uh, EIR is approved, that project can go forward. Is it saying that further uh, environmental analysis will need to be done for the two subsequent um, um, auxiliary lanes? And if that's the case, can we really call them part of the baseline? Uh, I'm a well, little I, I, Sarah's ready to answer that, but uh, I, I do know that those two projects do need a project level uh, environmental analysis. They, they have, you know, they're in, included in the programmatic in, in the tier one, but they have not been, they will have to do a tier two okay, study so for I'm, each one. I'm misremembering that, Does, but they are, are all three included <coughs> in the baseline or is only the one included in the baseline for this study? Sure. Um, I'll let Ginger answer. All three auxiliary lanes are included in the baseline and the reason for that is because they have, there is funding available for Measure D. So what the projects that we're evaluating in the study are projects that do not have um, funding available for them in order to figure out what our priority projects are. Okay, thank the only, you for that. The only differential, can I make an exception to that? The exception to that is the trail along the rail right of way that does have funding through Measure D, but given the question of what trail, we felt it was important to evaluate that in all of the scenarios um, given the various different types of trail that would be um, potentially be implemented. Okay, thank you. I have a question, a clarifying question, Mr. Schifrin. Uh, on your first first request that we provide a list of projects already in the regional plan, do you mean ones that are already funded and in the regional plan or just that are no, listed? No, that, are, you know, we have a, the, uh, you know, I forget whether it's the unconstrained or the constrained, but the uh, projects that we think we're gonna be able to do over the next 20 or 30 years from the last regional transportation plan. So the constrained, you want from the constrained? Yes, plan. which ones that are part of these okay. various scenarios are already in the transportation plan as opposed to those that are not. I'm sure we can do that. Um, Ginger, did you wanna add? I can take a, um, a, a try at giving those and then we can come back and verify those. Are you thinking mostly on the highway or you want all of the different projects? I th I, you don't need to do it now, I don't want it now. Okay. I think it'd be useful to, for the commission to get a list of what's already been decided to move forward on. It may be the Mission Street improvements, it may not. It may be the highway one, uh, the bridge over, highway over the San Lorenzo River. But I'd just like to know for each of the scenarios, which of the projects are in the RTP and which of the projects aren't in the RTP. I think that. And to differentiate what's on the constrained list versus the unconstrained as well. Most of these projects are in the RTP. Well, let's but get a list of it. Okay. Uh, I'd like to know whether all of them. And then on page 21, where it has the auto travel time and speed for State Route 1, um, I looking at, this is table eight, looking at the, AMP going from um, Bay Avenue to Sokol Drive and then to Sokol Drive to um, Highway 17, it shows 36.52 miles per hour and 48.81 miles per hour. I don't know who, you know, I, I don't have to come in that direction, but certainly testimony we've received over time this seems extremely high for what the average speed is during the peak hour. I mean, when I go the other way at those times that I have to, I see cars lined up barely able to move 10 miles an hour. So I'm just concerned about how the accuracy of that, um, of those projections. So the travel time was actually taken from a data set called the NPM RDS or the National um, Highway Performance Measurement System. It's an FHWA product that's updated on an annual basis. So they actually do directly survey travel time along uh, roadways on the National Highway System, which SR1 is one. Um, so what often happens with travel time, um, it is a uh, a variable mixture. It's not the same from one day to the next. So typically on a congested corridor, you'll have some days that are not so bad. Some days there'll be a crash or there'll be some kind of other activity. Those bad days do typically resonate with people a lot more 
than the typical day. So oftentimes when we report an average travel time, it does seem a little faster than what people are expecting to see. So we also discuss travel time reliability um, to show that variability. And you can see that those sections do have uh, pretty unreliable travel time. So there are definitely days that do not perform at the level shown here on the average. Do you want to identify yourself for oh, us? I'm sorry, Daryl DePontier with Kimpney Horn. Yeah. And, and I ride that segment o almost every day. And after 41st Avenue, it definitely, it changes to be before 41st Avenue. So. Okay. Well, we certainly sometimes get uh, testimony about how long it's no, taking no, I've people to get I've seen the backups uh, south of 41st Avenue. Oh, um, the next question I have is on page uh, 35, and it's table 16, screen line throughput. And I, I'm not sure I understand this, be, but it's saying, if, I'm under, if I do understand it, that um, looking at various modes of uh, travel through the different sections of the county, and if, am I reading this right, that 883 pedestrians start at the San Lorenzo River, and 18 of, 18 of them every day walk to Rio Del Mar Boulevard? That seems to be what it's saying. Um, as, your, as the chart, the table measures how many people are going through each of the screens. Okay. So on, on, on page um, 34, the page right before that table shows a map of the screen lines. And so what a screen line throughput analysis is, if so the um, number that you were just quoting, the pedestrians on San Lorenzo River, so that's screen line number one. So the 883 are the number of pedestrians that would cross that screen line during the peak period PM, I believe it's four to 6 PM. So, so that what, what this really means is that there may be 18 people that are going from uh, State Park Drive to Rio Del Mar Boulevard. They're not necessarily going the whole way. Across the screen line at Rio Del Mar Boulevard, which is labeled screen line eight, the data that was collected there, and this is actual data at the various different intersections. This is the baseline information. This is not a forecast. It shows that there's 18 pedestrians crossing that screen line. There was data collected. So they may be coming from anywhere along the way. Okay, I didn't read it correctly. On page 75, where it talks about transit vehicle miles traveled, as I understand it, only the transit district service is considered in estimating transit vehicle miles traveled. Um, since Liftline carries a significant number of riders and their data is readily available, shouldn't it be included in the, um, the, the calculation of vehicle miles traveled as well? Or did I miss that as also? Uh, we did not incorporate that data into this analysis. I think the assumption was moving forward that that service would not be impacted by any of the alternatives. So it was part of the baseline. Um, so in this performance measure, we're looking at transit vehicle miles traveled. This is the baseline information that's provided by Metro that they submit to the um, National Transit Database. And so uh, this is, as, as uh, Daryl mentioned, this is a baseline number. When we're forecasting forward for the various different projects, we want to have a number similar to compare it to. And so adding in for the baseline, the lift, some of the lift line numbers would then diffuse some of these numbers forward because we don't, we aren't going to be looking at lift line necessarily in any of these projects that we're um, evaluating. Not, and that's not to say that there wouldn't be changes necessarily in the future and more funding for its lift line, but that is not one of the projects we're evaluating in the study. Okay, I guess I get it. Um, <laughs> the next one, I have a question on page 84, and that has to do with the differences between the various scenarios. and. I have the same concern with a number of the tables, and it refers to some of the testimony that we've received about how similar the results of the different scenarios are. And I come from a, um, have some background in social sociology and social methodologies, and one of the 
uh, issues that comes up is how statistically significant are the differences in what you find. And if they're not statistically significant, then what you're seeing, you don't know whether the, there's really a difference between a particular scenario or whether it occurred by chance. And that's what statistical significance is, is kind of looking at. It's what's the likelihood that the, that the difference between the various alternatives occurs by chance. And I think especially since what we're talking about are scenarios with lots of, all of them having lots of assumptions and lots of uncertainty in terms of their projections, I think it would be useful to uh, under, get some understanding about whether there is a statistically significant difference between them or whether, you know, it's usually to what they call 0.05 when I was in school. I don't know what they're calling it now. Um, but I don't know. It, it, may, it was of concern to me to see so many of the scenarios looking very, very similar in terms of their outcomes. And um, I think some kind of a statistical analysis would be helpful to the commission. So it's a, it's a great comment. We've heard that comment throughout the public process as well, and we acknowledge that you know everything looks like it's one mile or two miles up or down. One needs to realize that this is the um, daily um, VMT that you see, and if we have 100,000 cars on Highway 1 only on a daily basis, and we reduce the VMT by one mile per hour, and you take the 100,000 per day, you analyze that, you take it through 20 years, we're talking a billion hours that are saved through just one mile per hour that you drop. In, so, so there is, it's, it is statistically significant over the lifespan of the design that you, that you um, assume for the facilities that you, that you develop. Um, we, we will um, include in the comments something that's more digestible to explain that that difference, even though it's just a very small percent on VMT, how significant it is for travel. Um, across the um, across the um, the model that we've analysed, um, th I also want to say that these kind of differences in in lots of other RTPs, regional transportation plans, or similar studies that we do, this is the kind of results that you see. Um, you will not, un uh, you know, unless you build a new freeway, that you double up on capacity is where you're going to see huge increases in speeds. Um, you, know, you can see higher changes in VMT, but this is a very typical result for the kind of study that we're doing here. I, I think that, that I don't disagree that th the small difference could be great over the, the uh, timeline. What I'm really asking is a methodological uh, question, which is what when the outcomes are so close, to what extent are the differences due to the numbers that are there, and what, to what extent are the differences due to chance? That, you know, if there was, if one projection's a little bit wrong, then scenario uh, B looks even better, or p scenario B looks worse. And that, that's really what I'm talking about, not whether the particular differences are important. They may be important, but since they're so close to each of the scenarios in many points are so close to each other, it seems that understanding the, whether methodologically the, the projection can be seen as being potentially valid um, has to do with that kind of statistical significance. So that, that's really the question that I'm asking. Mike Schmidt, Kimley Horn Associates. Try to, I'll try to, try to answer it. It's, it's kind of a complicated question, but I will say part of the challenge is obviously the aggregation of the data. So if you look at the ag data in a more disaggregated fashion, the differences are more stark in different locations. So, and what Frederick said is true. If you look at a small differential along across a great area, it has a big impact. But the model is based on, um, it is calibrated and validated. So there is st statistical tests that we do run to make sure that the, the analysis tool is valid per Caltrans and FHWA standards. Um, and you would see that we make when we make these changes, you do see reactions to those changes. So the differentials between the baseline and each of the scenarios are statistically significant, and they are representable. And it's very, it's much clearer when you look at specific locations. Like if you look at the, the Highway One and you look for a widening, you will see, okay, well the capacity changes. 
the incre there's an increase in traffic volumes on that, which are commensurate with that capacity change as, as traffic diverts or traffic is rerouted based on changes in origins and destinations. So the model is sensitive to the types of things that you're asking. So if I'm understanding what you're saying, and I'm not sure I am, okay. uh, <laughs> there was consideration of statistical significance in terms of how the different scenarios were put together. I, I think in terms of the output, I don't know that we've, I, I, w I wouldn't characterize it so much as this, the, out, the outcomes are perhaps statistically significant as much as the tool is statistically significant and tested to it. So, I mean, I guess I'd have to think through that question because the way we design these tools is to first validate them and calibrate them so we know they're accurate representations of the real world. And then we go out and try to forecast into the future. So when we do make changes, we do see reactions. I, I, like I said, I think the, the issue is, and the confusion is more just with the aggregation of the data so it has a an effect of creating a perception that there are very small differences when the differences are more stark than that. Well, I think it would be helpful to clarify that in the responses or the final of this study, if that, because it, it is confusing. I have another uh, methodological concern with this page. I never like graphs that start halfway up the, uh, <laughs> halfway up the, the amount, because it, it shows differences that really aren't that great if you start with zero. So the graphs in figure 30 show big differences between the scenarios, but one starts at 38.5 and goes to 40.5, the other starts at 31.5 and goes to 35. They should both start with zero, because if you're at zero, then you, you really see the relative difference. If you start where these start, it gives a misleading sense of what the difference are, differences are between the, so I would ask, uh, I, th I think this was the only chart where that was done. Usually they start with zero, but I think it's just in terms of the a public perception of how different are these uh, scenarios, that would be a better, that would be a better way to do it. Okay. Um, on page 90 and following, um, I was frustrated with the, figures because there was no legend. Um, they show something. Yeah. They're, compar <laughs> they're comparing a blue line with two gray lines, but I didn't know what the gray lines were. Right. And so I think that needs to be, I guess there are about four, I guess there's one for each uh, scenario. So that, that needs to be c corrected. I'm not going to uh, repeat my comments every time, I hope, um, but um, I had the same comment about statistical significance on page 93 with the uh, uh, screen line throughput table. And then on page 97, I was concerned that the draft unified corridor study, UCS, only considers federal funding for transit projects on the rail line. And the, the assumption leads to the conclusion that there is gonna be minimal outside funding allocated for rail projects in the later analysis, which obviously means that there's going to be more uh, local funding that's gonna be needed. Um, with the recent adoption of the state rail plan, as has been mentioned in public uh, testimony, there may be significant state funding available in the future for uh, rail projects like a, rail, a passenger rail project in Santa Cruz. Uh, I, I would ask that, I know that the rail uh, plan just came out. I looked at it briefly and uh, had a hard time making heads or tails of it, frankly. Um, in terms of what it's actually going to do. But I would ask that staff and the consultants take a look at that and, if appropriate, revise those figures because they make a big difference in terms of, since there's not a whole lot of rail funding at the federal level, uh, and there seems to be a real commitment to regional rail in the state rail plan, that could really change, and that could really change the whole economics of uh, passenger rail because obviously what ultimately is gonna determine the ability to move forward is the potential availability of outside funding. Okay, so thank you. Um, all right, so we have details 
on page 99, um, this is where the, this is table uh, 38, the new public investments for capital costs. And this is where the problem that I mentioned about the lack of, uh, or the limited um, uh, federal rail funding comes out. But there's also um, a typographical error in the chart. I don't know if it's been brought to your attention by uh, eagle-eyed members of the public, but on scenario E, uh, the local rail transit with interregional connections, it's listed as 25 um, million 800,000. I think given the other numbers, it's probably about 250 million 800,000. Somehow that, it, it, it doesn't add up. So I recommend that you take another look at that. Um, Uh, more questions about statistically than I, on page uh, 118 I am getting through I appreciate the commission uh, giving me the ability to this ask. is the purpose of the meeting is to allow you a chance to okay. ask questions so and we're not close to lunchtime yet so we're, we're not, not even close to the, please um, the this is Again, I had statistically significant significance concerns, but the table, which is uh, f table 43, indicates that scenario B, uh, with the rail op option, no uh, HOV lanes, only reduces uh, ve vehicle ma miles traveled um, a small amount. It's not disaggregated by, the VMT is not disaggregated by project, so, I wonder, I would like to find out what is the effect of rail option by itself on uh, VMT, and more importantly, um, can the impact of um, passenger rail on Highway 1 congestion be estimated? What assumptions were made about the reduction in uh, VMT with the rail option? Okay, page figures 36, table 40, 46. Again, I'm concerned about uh, statistical significance. Then on page 129, there's a sentence that I totally confused me. Uh, it's the last paragraph has a sentence, quote, the offset ratio of transit vehicle miles traveled between the baseline and no build estimates is used as a correction to the scenario transit outputs of the model. No idea what that means. Yes. <laughs> so some, I, you know, I'd prefer it in writing, because if you tell me what it means here, it's gonna go in one ear and out the other. If you write it down, I may be able to understand I'm curious. it. curious, okay, I'd just love to hear an answer. <laughs> <laughs> but we'll get it in writing. <laughs> That was a serious, wonky sentence. There's no doubt about it. <laughs> well, I want to say that most of what's in the Unified Corridor Study is comprehensible, I think, at least to me. And I thought it provided a lot of useful information and understandable information. So what I'm pointing out are the you know, pr pretty m unusual minor concerns where this wasn't the case. Um, on page 132, which is table 48, again, the trans, uh, transportation costs. The table provides estimates of the number of person trips by mode under the different scenarios. Um, the estimate for the percentage of household train trips under scenario B is 0.9%. I'd like to know what the basis is for that estimate. And then again, is there a statistically significant difference in the average household transportation cost between the scenarios? On page 143, the project cost estimates, uh, my understanding is that, that the estimates are for the total project cost and not the local project cost. But I think that should be clarified. It isn't, doesn't really say that, but I'm pretty sure that's what's going on here. 
So the, so the cost estimates would include um, any local project. So if there was an intersection improvement at uh, right, but the, the funding for them, the, it's not looking at how much funding is going to come from the outside. This is the total project That's, cost. This is just construction not the cost. Local project yeah, cost. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's construction I think that cost. That needs to be That's clarified because okay. it was a little confusing to me when I uh, first read the um, the, the document. Um, 43. Okay, I'm almost I'm on my last page here. Okay, there. It, the is the same page 143. The document states that the facility maintenance for passenger rail service is assumed to be split between the RTC and the passenger rail service uh, operator. Uh, um, I question what the basis is for this assumption. In the past, the commission has made it really clear that the cost of passenger rail uh, will be borne by the operator. And we've made that clear with excursion and I think um, it's been talked about for passenger rail generally. So I'd like a clarification of where that, w what the basis of um, the, the assumption that they're going to be shared is. And then on page 145, where it talks about the high occupancy vehicle lanes, unlike some of the other um, cost estimates, there doesn't seem to be um, a contingency or a soft cost included in the project, if project costs. If those are, are included, that should be stated. So um, it's impossible to know from the chart whether that's the case or not. Then on page 151, the passenger rail service in the, in the scope talks about the uh, service being only on weekdays. And I'm wondering why there isn't any uh, weekend service uh, projected. There is a particular reason why that was not included in the analysis. Um, no, no specific reason. I mean, it's a commuter service, so the intent is to um, relieve congestion with day AM, with day PM. It doesn't mean that it cannot run over the weekends, um, but the intent here was to analyze weekday travel because that's also, you know, in the AM and the PM um, is when the road system is as busy. Yes, it's busy over the weekends, but it's more spread out, but that heavy congestion for the commuter service is weekday AM and PM. Thank you for your pointing out the description on table A-10. Um, if you do do look at the operation and maintenance cost, we do have a line item for the weekend and holiday service, but the um, the, the ridership analysis is looking at weekday. I see, so I okay. Should, we we need to add that into the scope, so thank you. Am I missing something? It seems to be a typo uh, here where it talks about where the service will go. Uh, starts at the west side Santa Cruz and ends uh, in downtown Santa Cruz. I think it means downtown Watsonville is where it's going to end. And our Watsonville uh, members are happy to... to <laughs> <laughs> and in fact, it goes all the way to Pajaro. Yeah. Yes, but so I think in terms um, of what's being said, say it that. should be... Thank you, we can correct that. <laughs> okay. Um, On page um, 158, could you explain, uh, this is the trail next to rail, why there are sort of the general course, and then there are separate course for section uh, segments five and seven, um, which are quite significant. And I'm wondering how come those are broken out for just a portion of the uh, rail trail as opposed to the rest of the rail trail. So for the trail next to rail, there's a, a more detailed information about the cost estimates for segment five and segment seven since they're already funded. And so we took that information directly. Um, the rest of the trail next to rail was estimated using the Caltrans page 11 estimate. Um, so that subtracts out those two segments. Well, the, it's a separate line item for those costs. Right, but I just want to be clear that the rest of it doesn't include the whole rail line. Correct. 
Okay, thank you. Then on page 167, I guess this is related to my earlier question about statistical significance. This has to do with the traffic or the static model validation uh, tables B, B1 and B2. And I don't know whether I'm understanding the table very well at all, but as I read it, it seems like um, there are a lot of situations where the, I, and I, if I'm understanding right, this is where the model was validated. And so let's say for the percent root mean square error, um, the daily was supposed to be, it was supposed to be less than 40 percent something, but many, almost all of the actuals are, some of them significantly higher than 40 percent. And with uh, uh, B2, um, all, all of the peak hours were significantly higher than what the target was. So how does that affect the validation of the model that was used? Yeah, to be, to be clear, the, 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 we probably should have clarified for this table, but the targets and the daily are what we use to actually test the validity of the model, and that's what's required by FHWA and Caltrans. It's not uncommon to have greater variation between time periods for AM, PM, midday, and other stuff. That's an incredibly common outcome, but what we actually measure the validity of the model against is daily. So as you can see in daily, I believe it meets all of the measures. Um, okay, I, it's important that that be clarified okay. because somebody reading this would sort of say, hey, wait, is this a very good model? But right. um, it's important to, it seems to me, say what's We, going we can on. add that discussion. Um, 172, um, a couple of concerns. In the fourth paragraph down in the second sec, uh, uh, s the first, second line, first sentence, there seems to be a word missing because it just says XXX. And so I'm not, I'm, I'm sorry, 172. Uh, 172. I know you were rushing to get this out. Um, and so this is the only, and I don't think it's a big deal. Uh, but you took your level of service calculator from something. Oh. Yeah, it's, uh, it's from uh, the N NCHRP uh, report that we okay, used. Well, yep. So okay. that we'll, should we'll just be it. corrected yeah. in the, in you, the yeah. final. Um, and then um, the more substantive concern that I have is that it appears that in comparing the trail only with the uh, rail trail, there was an assumption um, that the rail trail would have 20% less users based on the fact that people had to go off the trail onto the streets at certain points. And given that most of the trips, at least the assumption is that they're 3.5 miles or less, and that people who are riding the trail, the, the bike lane or walking are gonna be wanting to get to where they're wanting to get, that 20% seems like a very high um, differential. And it becomes important because it then leads to uh, the bike trips on the trail only to be, um, uh, or on the trail with rail, to be about 11% fewer than with the rail trail. And the only real differential seems to be based on that assumption. So I would ask to, for some justification or reconsideration and some justification of why, where that assumption, what justifies that one-fifth fewer trips um, simply because for part of it, not even most of it, people would have to exit the, the rail line under the current plan. Would you like some clarification today on that analysis? Yes. Um, so for the trail ridership numbers, the, there was a pretty detailed analysis performed, which was based on an accepted best practice standard from the NCHRP, which is essentially you take a, uh, do a GIS analysis of the populations in the vicinity of the trails. Um, and the trails were broken up into one mile segments, looked at the population between the trail and half a mile, from half a mile to one mile, and one mile to a mile and a half. 
and then um, used information that we that is available from the California Household Travel Survey on the uh, the number of people that ride their bikes now and applied that percentages as well as a multiplier for the future of over three times the number of people that would be in the buffer to um, ride the trail. Only the, se only the one mile segments in the vicinity of the Capitola Trestle area where the current short term assumption is for the trail to um, route around the Capitola Trestle um, would be uh, reduced by that 20%. And so given the almost 30 mile or, or 30 mile plus uh, length of the trail, it was only the one mile segment around the Capitola Trestle. And we, we also looked at um, ridership going in eastbound and westbound direction for each of those one mile segments based on employment opportunities um, from census data. So. If people are, if there's a population um, near 41st Avenue, we looked at if, if people are going in the eastbound direction over Capitola Trestle, it would only be that portion that would be reduced by that 20%. And it was, um, I believe, two of the, the two, two of the one mile segments were affected by that reduction um, in, on each side of the trestle. But that seems to lead to an 11% reduction in the number of riders overall. There's an, there's an overall, so the um, trail ridership numbers for a trail only, it's on the order of about 15,000 bicyclists and 7,000 pedestrians. For a trail next to rail or trail next to uh, BRT, it's closer to 14,000 bicyclists and um, I don't know if I'm getting my numbers right. It's just five, 500 less pedestrians for the trail next to rail. Well, I think, um, to be honest, I don't really understand the uh, rationale that you've given for the difference, But so I'd only ask that you explain it better in the final. Will do. Mm -hmm. And then my, f and thank you, my final um, point um, has to do with uh, uh, an issue that one of the uh, members of the public brought up, and that is the timing of when are things going to happen, um, because I think that uh, that is an important consideration. My example is going to be different than the uh, person who testified, um, because um, the commission doesn't have money, or the, and the jurisdiction don't have money to do the vast majority of these projects. There isn't the money to do the rail trail uh, all the way through. There isn't money to do the trail only all the way through. Um, both of them depend on uh, outside funding sources. The commission's gotten some for certain segments, but not for other segments. Um, there is a cost that the uh, um, UCS looks at for the trail only, but that's, there is a different timeline here. Um, the commission can go through the process of applying for funds. There's no, uh, there's no loss to the commission by going forward with the rail trail. There's a significant loss to the commission in removing the tracks. And I think looking at the timing issue for these various projects will be impo is important in terms of understanding the ability, the capacity of <coughs> the commission to do these various projects. For most of them, we don't have the capacity. We're hoping we'll get it through Measure D funds, through various state funds, through uh, uh, other kinds of grants. Uh, but we're not going to be under the gun to do anything very quickly. Um, with the trail only, that's not the case. If the commission should decide to uh, adopt the scenario with trail only or to adopt the trail only as an option, it's going to have to do things relatively quickly. Um, it's kind of making a decision. And I think the, the UCS needs to recognize that. And so I would ask that we get some uh, information about sort of timing considerations for the various projects. What has some funding set aside? What doesn't have some funding set aside? And what kinds of pressures would be on the commission 
to carry out some of these uh, some of these projects. So I want to thank the commission for uh, letting me go through all of my questions. Um, I do appreciate it, and I look for I appreciate the responses that I get, and I look forward to getting additional uh, the commission getting additional information in writing. No, I appreciate uh, you sharing the questions. I know some commissioners have met with staff. I, I think uh, uh, commissioners have mentioned that they've spent time with staff. Others have asked questions here. Others are still asking questions. So uh, this is the purpose of it. We're trying to uh, provide lots of opportunities for both the public and the commission to ask questions to better understand this important study and the implications thereof. So I think Ms. Kaufman Gomez had, had a question. Um, yes, there's a, a few things that are for follow-up, um, and, and I agree. I, I, I'm not a planner. Um, this particular um, report in itself is not something that it's um, relative to me in terms of getting this material and being able to digest the material, being able to you know r put it all together in terms of um, piecing it. And it would be very helpful for us to know, you know, what is funded. What is you know speculative based on the different decisions? So e even if it's like you know, if it's green, it, we know we have the money for it. Um, the other part of it too is make sure we know what our measure D because I, I'll tell you our voters have said yes to D, and the last thing Watsonville wants is to lose any of the D projects that we've sacrificed quite a bit of our money and resources to go towards um, with any of these scenarios. So I wanna make sure that we can carefully watch them and, and make sure none of them <coughs> slip off for some of these alternatives. Um, uh, not too much is talked about freight. Uh, I just wanna make sure that we have that out there, that there's a bit more conversation in the report about freight um, in case there's some sort of a hybrid option that comes from any of these scenarios here uh, because we don't wanna lose freight for Watsonville. We, we know that that's a very clear um, concern that we do have in our community. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about maybe the cost subsidies. I know right now our bus cost subsidy is $8.50 per rider, and I think that we need to see a little bit more on the, the scenarios on this, on what that cost may look like. Um, and the outreach, um, this has been a concern. Um, I know that uh, we, we had the presentation in Watsonville, I've asked for this to be more in terms of where our public is located for them to come to, because at, at six o'clock in Watsonville for any of our commuters, even if they can get back to Watsonville by 6 p.m., if they've been on this road for an hour and 20 minutes, it's probably the last place that they wanna show up. They wanna get home to their families. And that we need to have some more flexibility with uh, getting the, the this basically a road show out there as well as in uh, English and Spanish. I don't know if your FAQs are bilingual. Um, I think that's necessary. I, I know that we are doing what we possibly can to push it out bilingually in Watsonville when we're getting this information out. So there's a, a, probably a pocket list of things there that maybe you can share some comments on. I'd love to address that comment right now. If um, We um, heard a lot from the members of the Watsonville community in the last few days about um, needing a little bit more outreach, having the translator, having um, materials in Spanish, and so we have a performance dashboard in progress to be translated into Spanish. We're also working on the frequently asked questions, and also we're planning a focus group meeting in Watsonville that um, we will have um, as much of the Kimley Horn that can make it to that uh, meeting, as well as our TC staff. It'll be held in Monsonville. We're working towards October 30th, potentially in the afternoon, three to five. We still have to work out the details, but that's what we're working towards. We heard that um, possibly students would wanna be involved in that discussion as well. So um, the, we, we heard you and we're trying to um, be flexible and make this happen. In the, in the last couple of weeks since we met with you on October 4th, I believe there's been, uh, I think this is the 10th presentation on the Unified Corridor Study. We have uh, a number more. Um, we met with the Scotts Valley City Council last night. We have the uh, three remaining city councils to meet. We're also gonna be meet, meeting with Metro. Um, so there's a, a ton of outreach. We're collecting a lot of great information from our community and um, we're, we're planning to do more. And thank you for um, bringing up the idea of doing more for Watsonville. And, um, we will we'll be in touch about when the details of that get ironed out. Yeah, we, we had the Cabrillo College Chancellor at the Watsonville and 
to really engage the students and, and maybe even having a presentation at Cabrillo campus or UCSC campus would be helpful. Um, the millennials with ridership, I think that they'll have an impact of any of these decisions and uh, to get some of the feedback for those that are probably really, I, I think that our, our Metro right now with UCSC campus, I mean, they're, they're so full that um, there's people waiting for that bus just up in that area. So there's an impact that's gonna happen with a lot of people that are familiar with this type of ridership and that um, will be very influential with some suggestions and, and um, some ideas that may be fresh from what our memories or our, our mind is on the reports that we get. So I can't encourage it and stress it enough that we need to have that. And um, you know, <coughs> I, I don't know where exactly where or which group on the 30th of October. I know that we have a pretty solid rotary group. Um, I think that it, in talking to the chamber that was at our um, si state of the city address last night, um, I, I think that there is maybe an interest in maybe putting even a luncheon together with with a chamber. Maybe there's a mixed chamber, something like that. I mean, that may be the business community during the day. Um, what we're not getting to are the workers that are on the road getting home and n so they're, they're at work and they can't get there during the day and they're not wanting to show up at six o'clock either. And so we're trying to do what we possibly can to disseminate the information and get it out there and matriculate it the best that we can. And uh, and that's why these roadshows are important. This is significant. This isn't a decision that we're, we're making lightly. And we don't wanna um, miss um, an opportunity to get this word out in any capacity for this entire county. And that might be a perfect segue to, to say that our next meeting of the uh, Regional Transportation Commission will be happening in Watsonville on Thursday, November 1st uh, at nine o'clock in the morning. And then we are also having a special um, meeting of the RTC to just talk about this item uh, at six o'clock uh, also in Watsonville on November 15th. Uh, so it's, uh, there's, there's a lot of effort to reach out to different parts of the community. Um, and uh, the staff uh, has been spending a lot of time trying to, trying to be there in a lot of different ways and they will continue to work on responding to the questions that were talked about today, um, uh, continuing to meet with uh, stakeholders uh, and uh, these uh, public sessions that are gonna be uh, taking place as well. Mr. Schiffer. Uh, I, yes, I'd like to talk about the timing issue because it seems to me given the uh, amount of meetings that are occurring and the amount of comments that are being presented, it's really putting a, a tremendous burden on the staff and the consultants mm -hmm. to try to get their recommendation to the commission by November 15th, is that? So that Correct. the commission could make a final decision on December 6th. I, I'm not sure that's realistic. Um, and I'm wondering whether it might be more realistic to uh, expect the recommendation on December 6th after our hearing in Watsonville on the 15th, and then considering uh, in December, I mean in January, our meeting in January, making a final decision. I, you know, I, there are many of the comments that you've received, and I'm not necessarily referring to mine, are substantive, and uh, they sh require some thought time, maybe some analysis. And I think it just is asking a lot that if there's gonna be a meeting, other meetings to do that. Finally, let me say I do not support having another group uh, do peer review. Um, I just have been going through another study for another part of the county where the consultant did an economic analysis, it was sent to a peer review, and then the consultant just responded to the analysis and said why well, the peer review people didn't know what they were talking about. So it's like es experts will disagree. We hired the consultants we hired. Um, it's our job to evaluate the credibility of the work they came up with. Uh, we're gonna hear from the public. Some people like it, some people don't like it, some people like parts of it, some people like don't like parts of it. We're gonna have to take all that into consideration and make a decision, and I think um, that should be the end of it. Uh, thank you, Mr. Schiffer, and uh, uh, the chair and vice chair will uh, talk with uh, uh, our executive director, and on our November 1st meeting, we'll have some idea um, uh, about what's going to be possible by the 15th and what's not. So, okay, thank you. Um, Mr. Mulhern. Uh, thank you, just very briefly. If, if uh, we have updates to the information that are s substantive and vast, can we please have them prior to the meeting? I mean, prior to 
the day of the meeting. Um, trying to review these in the five minutes before we start the session is, is challenging. Thank you. All right, well, look, let's get everybody in here. Ms. Brown. I'm just, right now, I just wanna um, thank everybody, f well, particularly Commissioner Schifrin for all of your very meticulous comments and questions. I shared many of them, so I won't repeat them. And I also wanna say it would be really helpful to get this information in our hands earlier because it, it just seems rude to be reading while we're listening to members of the public and staff discussing very important matters. Thanks. Mr. Bator. I also want to acknowledge Mr. Schifrin's uh, effort at a deep dive and he did stimulate on one question and I believe the, the representative from Kimley Horn was going to answer that question on page 129. <laughs> I'd rather not be in suspense because it was kind of confusing. So if you wouldn't you mind might. taking a minute to answer that one question about the uh, <laughs> the, the offset ratio, I, I'd appreciate it. Oh, you massage that. <laughs> Daryl DePonte with Kinley Horn. Uh, yeah, so basically what that sentence is just trying to say is that we didn't rely s exclusively on the results of the transit output model. We reviewed um, other characteristics um, and did some off-model adjustments based on our assumptions with um, particularly the bus rapid transit, looking at the travel time um, and other factors based on what's um, in the national research in terms of the ridership elasticities and responses to different things like station designs and Per travel time being the most important one. Okay, uh, Mr. Johnson. Thank you, Chair. Um, oh, so sorry, Mr. Bertrand. No. no, it's your turn. I saw Bruce and you, that's fine. I go ahead. I've called on you, Mr. Johnson. You could, you have the floor. Oh, all right, thank, thank you. you. I, I, do um, you. I would all, you know, um, you know, even though I uh, raised questions about this study and so forth, I appreciate the work that went into it. Um, I do feel, given by uh, Commissioner Schifrin's uh, responses and pertinent questions, uh, that this, these are the types of questions that should have been and, and, and was pursued by uh, Commissioner Bertrand uh, in terms of like, almost like a steering committee along the way so instead of getting a draft or, or a report um, that has a massive number of questions and you know, what are the sources and so forth that we could have periodically giving some input. This is very staff centric, okay? Every time nobody came to the commissioners for their input, it was always the staff, the staff, the staff, whispering in the ear without really much input from, from commissioners, you know? I've been on this commission for almost 17, 18 years. You know, I might have a little perspective. I'm not saying I'm the smartest guy in the room. Um, you mentioned, and it was mentioned by staff that, you know, this is essentially a peer review based on prior studies. Those prior studies, like, you know, let's dust off the, uh, let's dust them off and bring them out because some of them are 10, 15 years old. Um, and with respect to a peer review, I believe we did a peer review when we, when we bought the, the line for $11 million from the state because they're useful, right? There's so many moving parts here that it's gonna take more than just you know uh, a, a few meetings from the community uh, and then uh, you know, us going through this. I mean, you have uh, 10 or 11 commissioners with lots and lots of questions in terms of uh, is, it, is it valid? Is it reliable? What, what are the sources of your information? Um, I do wanna address the special needs. A couple of people talked about special needs and what a great thing uh, the rail would be. I happen to have a special needs mother. Uh, she's 95. She does in fact live in Watsonville. Uh, she's uh, legally blind. She lives al lives alone. Um, and for the past, I don't know, three or four years, she's probably taken 50 trips uh, with uh, Paracruz and Liftline. They do a beautiful job from door to door in helping her be able to have some some amount of individuality. So she would never take it. I I, I just know it. She would never take a lift line to a train 
then take a train and then get lift line because it would be, it'd be impossible to negotiate. Um, I'm really impressed by the people that have come forward and talked about how valid a bus system is, okay? How, you know, if we look at, if we're really looking for solutions and really looking for uh, avoiding costly mistakes, a bus system uh, offers probably the, 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 the best bang for the buck, the less, uh, least amount of risk for our taxpayers and could be integrated with uh, all of these scenarios in a very meaningful way. Um, you know, with respect to the rail, okay, because people have talked about the trail only and so forth, I only, you almost only have three words for a, a rail system, and it's the high-speed rail in the state of California. Uh, lots of things were promised there, okay? This is almost a microcosm of that situation. You know, 10, 12 years ago, a bond was passed. It was going to cost $25 million. Now the estimates are from 60 to $70 million. It was going to be done by uh, uh, 2030 or 2028. Uh, it's not going to be done anytime soon. It may not ever happen. Uh, the funds that are coming from private citizens and also, quote, the federal government uh, were promised. They're not coming. So. Um, you know, part of my reluctance in uh, jumping on any sort of rail system has entirely to be that I'm not prepared to put the taxpayers at risk for something like that. And, you know, w with respect to this study, um, you know, I'll quote Andy, I guess I get it, okay? But there's so many unanswered questions and they're so complicated. I mean, Ginger did a beautiful job in explaining something um, about bicycles and you know the first mile and so forth, uh, but after about the third sentence, again, I'm I'm not the brightest guy. You lost me, okay? Because this is complicated stuff, okay? So you know I'm I'm looking for solutions. Um, I'm looking for probably, and, and I agree with uh, Commissioner Schifrin. You know we're not going to be able to absorb all this by the six. I, it's j just not going to happen, okay? Um, we can pretend it is, and, and all the answers will, or all the questions will be answered, but this is complicated. We, you know, we have um, at risk, you know, if, if, if we move forward in, in, in such a way, maybe 1.1 to 1.3 billion dollars that we commit ourselves to, and we want to do it within the framework of, you know, a couple of months. This, this study took uh, over a year to complete, um, and now all of a sudden we want to rush it and say, okay, we have to have something by uh, December 6th. I think that's just totally unrealistic. Um, and, uh, you know, there's so much uncertainty that has to be nailed down, additional questions. So let me just say, this was presented, this study was presented to the, to the um, public in what, eight, 10 meetings or whatever, but so many questions have been asked that question the uh, validity of it, just on specific things. Again, I'm not trashing the study, I think it was well done, but there, there are essential questions that have to be answered, but we've forwarded and presented a study that is incomplete to uh, over the past uh, week or two. So do we have to go back to the people with this uh, amended study and say well, this is really what 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 the study is all about. Um, maybe we do, because what we got and you know I have to say, I, I I like the concept of a dashboard, but one of our council members last night said it was just indecipherable. Couldn't get through it. Didn't understand it. And she's she's a she is an alternate on this commission, so. Um, no, reliability, validity, uh, statistically insignificant or significant, these are all important questions that have to be answered. And I think it's just uh, something that this community and particularly this commission should take very seriously before we commit a billion dollars towards something. We wanna be sure before we do that. Thank you. Thanks, so Mr. Bertrand. So um, whether it took a year or two years to do, I'm beginning to appreciate uh, the staff time that went into this. 
Um, I'm learning a little bit about the nuances of trying to make apples, oranges, and grapefruits and everything else sort of get on the same table so that you could get a coherent whole and try to come up with scenarios that you could compare to each other. Basically trying to use older studies and make that present. Um, so if I could go off topic a little bit, Chair. Oh, please try to stay on topic. Okay, just, just but try. I will stay on, but it's, it's an example. So as you know, in Capitola we have Measure L, and the reason why I supported putting that on the ballot for Capitola citizens is because I wanted them to get involved in this discussion. I wanted people in Capitola and broader than Capitola to actually start thinking about all the different issues and nuances of the issues before them. Because probably the people in this room are the ones that have been focusing on this the most for over a period of time, right? But to think about the general public, I don't think that has actually been there. It's now before them in Capitola for Measure L. And to some extent, it's been a very divisive battle. I think I've lost friends over it. I think I've gained friends over it. It's, it's very interesting. But the main thing to me is I've never seen someone, excuse me, people in general, so engaged in this issue. So that being said, a lot of people try to talk about, let's have a peer review. And I have to admit that idea was floated and it seems very attractive. But I'd like to say also that I think a lot of these studies were in a sense peer reviewed. These, these are studies that were done by info geeks, if you wanna call them. And I take that as a compliment because I've been an info geek myself. And you don't think about trying to sway things as much as you do trying to understand things. And I think that's something important for us to understand. But I'd like to put out there, and I think Commissioner Schifrin talked about this a little bit, our ultimate peer review are the citizens. So pausing and allowing the people in this county to have the time sufficient for them to understand these issues, and most everyone on this commission has been saying in their second breath, I'm having problems understanding this. I may not be the brightest guy in the room, and I'm not for sure, and it's a difficult issue. And one reason why I want to stress this is because it's a critical part of our democratic process to allow the citizens to understand what decision is that they're being faced with. It is critical. I understand staff wanting to push something because they think this is what it is. They see the path forward and there's a dynamic and it's a constant dynamic that is probably in every single community in this country between people who are tasked with carrying out something, that's the staff, and the public who has to pay for it and who has to live with it. So I accept that. We all have our roles in this country and in this democracy. So as Commissioner Schiffrin suggested, we need some more time. And I think others have suggested that also. Uh, he took the words out of my mouth in terms of one issue, and that is timing. There hasn't been in my mind an accurate temporal analysis. I brought this up before. I think we need to know what's possible right now. D passed because people weren't getting home or they weren't getting to work on time. D passed because there was real problems in front of people's driving habits, getting kids to work, picking kids up from daycare. I mean, it was crazy for me and my wife, and we both work. Both work, high intense jobs, and trying to pick up the kid, you're 10 minutes late, you get charged. These are real issues for people. And if our highway can't solve those kinds of problems for people, what is it gonna look like when we ask for a scenario to be voted on and there's so little differences between them? D goes out, what, 28 years now or something like that. We have to fund a lot of this stuff. To say that we're gonna fund it and everyone's trying to say, 
I don't see much difference between A, B, C, and D, you know. The percentages are quite small. And I remember some of the answers that in aggregate out 10 years and stuff like that, I totally agree. That is absolutely true, it adds up over time. But when people are in the voting booth and they see such a little difference between the various scenarios, I don't think it's gonna pass. So to me, that's a political reality. I'm pretty new to this in terms of politics. This is my first major elected position, but I also know that the pocketbook, which translates to sustainability, because people are gonna be thinking, hmm, Am I gonna do this or do I want better paid police? Am I gonna do this or do I want my teachers paid so that my education possibilities for my kids are there? Hmm, am I gonna do this? Am I gonna get park and rec so kids have things after school so they don't get involved in gangs and such? Am I gonna do this when I see disparities between Wattsville, Scotts Valley, Santa Cruz, and Capitol in terms of how the money's spent? So I'm starting to try to look at this problem in a way that there's a solution. And so as Commissioner Schifrin brought up, timing, temporal analysis is important and what's on the books right now and what we can actually pay for right now with a high degree of certainty that funding options are gonna be successful in terms of grants. I'm almost willing to put on the table for the commissioners to think about that we need to truncate off the bottom half of some of the options because it's gonna take too long for them to even come to the table to be completed. Some of the options, and I think, I'm not gonna go into them right now because I think that's for further discussion, and some of it is divisive because we're so involved in them, but there's certain things we could do right now and so I'm looking for that table from staff to talk about what the options are right now that are feasible in terms of what we're ready to do, in terms of what we could actually fund without undue burden to this county. So that's some of it's gonna be shared by the county, some of it's gonna be from various grants and stuff like that. Now that may be a hard project to do, but I think it's a real one if this commission is going to provide leadership in terms of getting real solutions to the traffic issues we have in this county. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. McPherson. It'll be brief. I appreciate everything that's been, uh, the data and criteria that have been included in this, it's been a long haul, um, but I, I feel like we have to do something, but I'm not convinced that with the information we have that we'll do anything that's going to alleviate our huge transportation problem that we have in Santa Cruz County. Uh, I do agree this is going to take more time, and I, I accept the criticism that people say that government st studies things to death, and um, I think something is going to come out of this, but right now with the information, we have a huge amount of information but I don't feel comfortable in saying this is what's needed and why to alleviate the, the quagmire of our transportation network in Santa Cruz County. So I do think uh, it'd be good to have, let us have more time to, to look at this. And I appreciate uh, Mr. Shiver, uh, Schifrin getting on uh, you know, the snorkel and really going down deep to find out, you know, uh, ask some really good questions, so I appreciate that. Uh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Schiffer, you're gonna take another bite at the apple, I see. Well, I just, would, I just think it might be helpful to put the uh, study into its larger context. Um, we do a regional transportation plan. We uh, allocate money periodically uh, to various projects. We respond to requests from the various jurisdictions for projects that we have or they have. Uh, we do a five-year measure D um, projection of what projects could be done in five years. As I understood what this study was about, it was to take a long look at what the differences might be between a number of options um, uh, around our corridor between Watsonville and Santa Cruz. 
looking at the street system, looking at the highway system, and looking at the rail line, what were different options and what might be the result of um, making certain policy decisions for one set of options versus another. That was what we asked the consultants to do. And um, the commission ended up deciding to uh, pursue a set of five scenarios. We asked the consultant to really look at what those long-term, uh, what the long-term future might look like with under those various scenarios. And you know, I think they've done a really good job of trying to do that with the data that's uh, they and staff with the data that's available. I had questions, but overall, I thought the the study provided very, very useful uh, information about what might happen, whether any of it's going to happen or not, who knows. Uh, technologies could change. They could change, as was brought out, in terms of individual transportation. They could change in terms of rail transportation, in terms of car transportation. The, the future holds many unknowns. Um, my sense of, uh, I don't, I'm not quite sure what we hope to get out of a decision on this study. Um, the commission really responds to requests from local jurisdictions. Um, the commission has a regional transportation plan, which is really the planning document that has some um, legal force to it because we can't get state funding or federal funding for projects that are not in the regional transportation plan. This was a study that really let us look at a set of options for the future. Um, we, I think, and it was also required supposedly by Measure D in terms of really looking at the difference between the rail line trail along the rail and the trail only. And I think the study has done that. It's provided us uh, plenty of information. Could we get more? Sure. Uh, is there, are we not going to get a lot of uh, comments from people asking for more? But I think it does answer the question that the commission, uh, the, uh, the questions that the commission asked. And um, I, I do think we, it makes sense to take the t you know, take more time uh, to give uh, the public more uh, another opportun more opportunities to provide their input and give the staff and the consultant uh, 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 an opportunity to respond. In terms of public involvement, um, it, it's overwhelming how many meetings this, this process has, has, has had. I mean, it's an enormous number of meetings. So in terms of providing opportunities for the public to uh, be a part of the process, um, I think this, um, this process, we have gone beyond what is normally done for anything that I remember in terms of, um, in terms of the, the getting input, input from people. So um, I, I think from my mind, it's in, what I'd ask the com commissioners to think about, and a couple of commissioners have raised this, is really what do we want to do when a decision is made? What kind of decision are we really going to want to make about this study? And um, it should, when whatever we do is done, it should be as informed as it can be. But um, I, I think we're providing lots of opportunities, not only for the general public, but as even we've received today, we've see, received another consultant's report um, on analyzing the, the study that was done. So the commission's going to have a lot of information that it can take into consideration when it makes its final, when we make our final decision. Thank you. Um, uh, I'll just say that I really appreciate the hard work that has gone into this uh, study. Um, anybody who reads this study knows that it takes some um, understanding, um, and uh, I realized the things that I don't know about statistical analysis, uh, because there's a lot, you know, uh, in here uh, that I won't pretend that uh, I will completely grok by the uh, end of this process. Um, but the staff has been very helpful in answering questions. Um, uh, I thought that the public sessions have been good and well attended. 
Um, and I think that we will continue uh, to have this discussion with the public uh, and with the commission. Uh, and we'll make, uh, w when we're ready to take action, this commission will take action. And we'll, uh, we'll have to figure out w exactly what that's gonna be. Uh, the chair and vice chair will work with our executive director on uh, if we're gonna make any changes in the timing. Uh, but I appreciate uh, everyone's continued participation and, and involvement in this. Uh, this document isn't, uh, isn't gonna be uh, something that's gonna tell us everything. It sort of points us in the right direction. Uh, or the direction that we that we want to direct staff to uh, spend time on. So uh, I look forward to the continued discussion that we have, and we'll be back on November 1st uh, at an RTC meeting to, to continue that. So thank you for being here today. Uh, thank you for the public participation. Adjourned. We are adjourned.